Hi there and good afternoon. I'm John Dankosky from the Connecticut Mirror, and I want to welcome you to our special live Zoom event, winning the competition for talents and technology in Connecticut. I will introduce our panelists in just a moment. Thank you so much for being part of this important conversation. It's a conversation that is made possible in large part by the readers of the Connecticut Mirror who have said to us for years that economic development is a big piece of what they want to see the Connecticut Mirror cover. So our publisher, Bruce Putterman, has made a real effort to make sure that we are doing just that. If you wanna support independent coverage of economic development, politics and everything else that you read in the Connecticut Mirror, you can go to ctmirror.org right now and you can press that big donate button and make a contribution today. It helps to support everything that you read in the mirror and also all of the events that we have scheduled throughout the course of this year. All right, so for this hour, we're gonna have a lively conversation about some of these important issues important issues that actually were laid out in a re relatively recent piece by our friend Bill Gunther, who is so instrumental in putting this uh, panel together. This is in partnership with Connecticut Compact. It's a new nonprofit initiative committed to building consensus on the state's most pressing challenges and opportunities, focused on economic strategy, climate change, and election reforms. The piece that Bill uh, put into our CT viewpoint section is called Strangely enough, the same thing as our panel, winning the competition for talent and technology in Connecticut. There's a, a way that we can uh, sort of read along along the way. And Kyle Constable, who's running our event today, can put some links in the chat for you so you can read exactly what it is Bill's talking about. So without further ado, let's get into our conversation. I will say that if you have questions for our panelists at the bottom of the Zoom screen, Everyone knows how to do this by this point in the pandemic because uh, you've been in enough of these Zoom calls. There's a Q&A function at the bottom. Click on that and that Q&A function will allow you to ask questions of our panelists. I'll get to as many as we can. We can't obviously get to all of them. Uh, every once in a while, we will answer questions throughout the course of our conversation and don't have to necessarily go back to, uh, to the question that you've asked because we've already tackled it, but please put some in there. We also have a chat function open so you can have a chat amongst yourselves. Those questions that are in the chat won't necessarily make their way into the Q&A. All right, got all that? And we've just linked to Bill's uh, viewpoints piece in the chat in case you want to take a look at that. I wanna welcome in all of our guests. Margaret Keene is here. She's executive chair of Synchrony. She's also co-chair of Advanced CT. Jeff Sonnenfeld from Yale University is another co-chair of Advanced CT. Uh, Glenn Thames is former deputy commissioner of DCD. She's now head of economic development for Amazon in Connecticut and New York. And Jim Smith is here from JC Smith Advisors. He's the former co-chair of Connecticut uh, Economic Growth Commission, and he's a retired CEO from Webster Bank. Um, I wanna thank all of you for spending some time with us and joining us today. I know that all of you have gotten a chance to read Bill Gunther's piece, and we're gonna take apart some of the really key pieces that he um, is talking about here. Jeff Sonnenfeld, though, I wanna start with you, and I wanna ask, why now is such an important time to be having this particular conversation in the state of Connecticut? Well, thanks. It is a thrilled time, but I, I also just want to say, as we point to timing, that the, the, the timing of this discussion is great, the panel you've put together, but I do want to thank uh, Bruce and, and uh, CT Mirror, but, uh, and of course, Bill Gunther's great uh, foundational questions. Uh, I think that that entrepreneurial energy is a great contribution to us all, but John, so is your voice. Uh, you talked about all of our backgrounds. We don't want to diminish not just what you do at, at CT Mirror, but that great quarter of a century in public broadcasting, I, I guess it's sort of an insult these days to call somebody a pioneer, but I'm on the National Council on Aging, so we consider that a plus. But thank you for all that. Is uh, that uh, five years ago, we held a, a, a forum where it was filled with finger pointing and uh, Margaret was there. Uh, Glenn, you, you escaped this one somehow. Uh, uh, Jim was there. And it was trying to figure out how we could make things better in the state. We we had the the then governor there. We had uh, leaders uh, from uh, both sides of the aisle in the General Assembly. And every major sector was there. In fact, we were told because of the AFL CIO, the NAACP, the, uh, the, uh, the the nonprofit foundations that were there, is that it was the most representative forum uh, in the state's uh, entire 300 year history, both constitutional conventions and pre, you know, back to colonial days, pre-constitution. And, and yet, uh, just because we were all there didn't mean we were all harmonious. There was a lot of gripes, a lot of finger pointing. And it was a time where 
there was just so much, if there was humor in the room, it was kind of a gallows humor. Uh, I know Margaret and Jim didn't share that and they can speak for themselves and their own backgrounds, but they are really fantastic models of corporate citizenship and how to, to get past this. And, and Glendalyn, in terms of how she's been spanning sectors and working on this, can speak for herself as well. But the three of them didn't represent the kind of mood we had in that room, which is a negative mood. And it's so different today. It's such a, a positive spirit. There, as you can imagine, back then, uh, the uh, a lot of the, the finger pointing had to do with, of course, transportation problems, tax issues, and uh, and the un unfunded uh, liabilities and, and things of that nature. But the big takeaway, and I think Margaret and Jim will back me up on this, wasn't just the nature of those problems, but the sense of there being a lack of political will to even take these on that the legislature and the governor were working on important issues, but not as important as these. They were fighting over other issues and the major ones were just out there yawning. And of course, GE had just left and that was at a time where we thought that was a loss. I, uh, I don't want to say anything unpleasant about GE since uh, 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 Margaret is a, an alum of GE, but we should think of look where we are today in the state is that with strong $3 billion budget reserve and a $5.8 billion supplement to the pension contributions, are restoring the financial health uh, that, that many were looking for back five years ago. With uh, the budget deficit we saw at back then of about uh, oh, $5 billion, it's now a $4 billion budget surplus. That's an incredible change. And about uh, the 40 billions in long-term unfunded liabilities were, were still pretty stark, but now having contributed to 6 billion in surplus contributions, the pension funds these years, we've seen, we've seen um, a lot of uh, financial success Economic development, which is, I know we're, we're going to spend a lot of our time after getting past these foundational issues on, uh, as uh, right now is an exciting time because we're, we're seeing innovation, we're seeing uh, things happening. People complained, one of the biggest laments, in addition to some of the infrastructures that issues I mentioned, was people struggling to find qualified applicants. And I'm sure you want to get to that really briefly. And I'll just say quickly on that. Uh, that even after COVID struck, that we didn't have any downtime in our in our major manufacturers mm -hmm. in the state. That was not true of any one of the other 49 states in the nation, that enough PPE and things were provided. There's there no downtime. The advances in this workforce, doubling the number of STEM graduates in the, in the, over the last decade, were number two ranked in educational system by the Milton Institute and others assessing number eight in R&D spending, quality of life. I mean, it's just remarkable what we have in the diversity of, of course, of the geography here. This is one of our prettiest times of year, of course, with the, the foliage in, in New England and Connecticut can't be beaten. But even on infrastructure, 13 new Metro North Express trains that are 20% faster, uh, urban renewal that we've seen a 5% uh, increase in housing is a major issue, but in all cities, but still remains as an issue. And, and the highest percent of attracting young workers in Connecticut, any New England state, and that's a shocker to everybody. We had to check that data over six times. Even our colleagues in advanced CT were saying, wait, are you sure that's right? Is that in fact, we are attracting and holding younger workers than others. So this is a, a pretty good time, John. It, it, it seems like it's a pretty good time. Uh, Margaret, to, to what do you attribute that change in mood? I mean, obviously some of the numbers that Jeff just rolled off means that people are going to be a little bit more enthusiastic about uh, the possibility of bringing jobs, uh, new technology to Connecticut. But what else has changed, do you think, in the last couple of years? Well, you know, I think the state just in its foundation has some elements that are extremely positive. And I think through the pandemic, some of those came through. I mean, we have excellent schools. We have excellent communities. We have excellent beaches. We have really top-notch universities. And I think as corporations were looking to bring talent in, I know for Synchrony, at least for us, we've really tapped into UConn and the network that it provides in terms of bringing real talent here uh, into our company. But I think the more important thing is actually not only getting the, getting the talent, but keeping them in Connecticut. And I do think areas like Stanford and now Norwalk have become kind of cool places to live for younger people. So I, I think that transformation has made it um, a real plus for the state. It's not like you have to live in New York City anymore when you're young to be cool. You can live in Stanford or Norwalk. Um, and I know both my kids came in through uh, the school systems here um, and have many friends who now not only have bought or rented are now starting to buy houses, which is a good transition, I think. 
Yeah, it, Glenn, it's so interesting. It's almost as though over the course of the last couple of decades, we've been having a lot of these conversations in various boxes. One of them has to do with tax policy. One of them has to do with how we do at attracting big employers. Uh, as Jeff said, you know, everyone despaired when GE left its uh, corporate headquarters in Fairfield for Boston. Now we see in just recent days how that's going for GE in Boston. Things are changing an awful lot, but everything that Margaret just said is very important. We need to make it a place where people want to live and not just for the reasons of how much money are they going to make at their job, but just because Connecticut's a great place to, to be. How do you think that we start to make that even more, I don't know, well-known to people outside of Connecticut? Because it seems as though the state has kind of a lot to offer. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, John. Um, and it's so great to be here um, with old friends and um, on this particular uh, subject matter that is so um, important and critical to our state as a lifelong uh, Connecticut resident. So to your point, I think it is uh, paramount that we really start from a position of strength. And so Jeff read over many statistics on where our strengths are and our assets and capabilities. So how do we really lean in and double down and triple down on those um, based off where the economy is going, right? And so to the extent that we are uh, strong in certain specialized industries, how do we leverage that to ensure that we are setting, set, staying ahead of the curve um, and uh, telling that story and, and really creating ambassadors to tell that story uh, for us? And I know that's a lot of the work that Advanced CT um, has, has done over the uh, last several years in, in really lifting up employers um, and talent who is here um, and who wants to be here and kind of doing that campaign um, of why this is such a great place to live, work, and play um, and continue to make those investments. Jim Smith, how, how are we doing right now at aligning the jobs that we have with the talent we can attract. This has been a big part of what you and, and others have been looking at over the course of, of years. Do we have the alignments that we need to be able to create this, this economic growth that we're hoping for? John, first, let me say how great it is to be with you again. Thank you for hosting us today. And I wanna give kudos to uh, Bruce Putterman and Connecticut Mirror, of which I'm a proud supporter. And also uh, I wanna acknowledge Bill Gunther's great questions about what's the vision and how do we think we'll be able to achieve that vision because it really stimulates us to think forward because there is still so much that we can do. So I'm really delighted to be here on this panel with colleagues that I know are so deeply invested in the future of Connecticut and they give so much of themselves as do so many others around the state. It's one of the big changes I think that we're seeing that people really care about our state. We know we're on the upswing and there's so much we can do to make it better. You know, as far as alignment is concerned, I think that's the big question. When we had that uh, event that Jeff was describing about five years ago, uh, we were not in the very positive place that we are in today. Uh, and we've made a huge amount of progress since then. And one of the things that came out of that, and it was just about the same time we had delivered the commission's report on uh, fiscal stability and economic growth, we started to realize that the reason we've fallen so far behind was primarily more than anything else because our development of our workforce wasn't keeping up with the needs of our large employers. So not only could we not keep people who were here, we weren't able to attract people that we wanted to come here because they simply couldn't find the STEM trained uh, workforce that they needed. And that was one of the big findings in the Fiscal Commission's report. We actually recommended at that time that we attract a uh, university collaborative either to Hartford, New Haven, or Stanford that would specialize in turning out STEM graduates. They would be better able to meet the needs of you know, our businesses. And we would train STEM teachers and others who would be able to help to uh, turn around that workforce exodus because people were leaving because they didn't find the, the workforce trained to their liking here in Connecticut. So we eventually actually went to a commission report 2.0 that said it would take too long to perhaps to get that university working, but we did want to make sure that we got Yale and UConn and others involved in that. Uh, and so we recommended that there be a scholarship program. We're up to 4,000 scholarships each year for $5,000 each for 20 million the first year, growing to 80 million after four years. 
would help to uh, motivate people to want to be part of that workforce or to be the teachers and professors that would educate that workforce so that we could provide for the needs of our growing businesses. And I think that while we've made a lot of progress through the Governor's Workforce Council, through collaborations among businesses and academia and government in starting to turn out many more STEM graduates than we had before, we still need thousands more. So to have today's panel focusing on, okay, what are the gaps? What are the needs? How are we going to prioritize? I put it out as basically the number one issue that we have when we've made a lot of progress on, when I've heard Governor Lamont say, we still have a lot to do and likely we'll be addressing that going forward. But I, I would boil it down to say there's, there's four C's involved here. The first one is collaboration. You know, easy to say, oftentimes hard to do. Particularly you're talking about private universities and public universities, and you're talking about businesses of various kinds, and you've got multiple state agencies that have to be involved. Well, the Governor's Workforce Council is kind of a roadmap for us that shows that if you organize well and you're willing to collaborate, you can make a huge difference in adopting policy that will change the course of economic growth for the better. And I think that's central to what we're trying to achieve here. I think that all the players have to be willing to make a commitment over the long term. I'm not saying a sacrifice, I'm saying a commitment. It should be at least revenue neutral to all the players involved while building a workforce that will meet the needs of our employers, particularly our leading industry clusters going forward. Third one is capital. There's a lot of federal capital out there right now. That can be matched by state capital. It can be matched by private capital. We've got to get our heads together and decide, okay, where would that capital best suit us? What are we best at? What drives our economic engine? How can we make the most positive impact on the state and its business community and create opportunity for all of our citizens as a result? So that's another big question. And then it's this question of choices because we know you can't be all things to all people. You have to choose. You know, what are we best at? What is it that drives us forward? We need to invest there while making sure that we try to provide an opportunity for all to improve themselves and have an opportunity they wouldn't have had if we weren't making the investments that we will. So that's basically my take on it. We've come a long way. Uh, no question we're better off than we were five years ago, whether economically or fiscally. And as I've said, I think we're psychologically much better off, but we all acknowledge there's much we can do to further improve. And that's why I'm happy we're having this discussion today. You know, Jim, that's fantastic. John, I know uh, you're the moderator and we're supposed to be on the sidelines, but you did tell us in the prep session, it'd be okay if we jump in with a quick comment. Jump in. Uh, that's okay. I just want to say that, 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 that Glenn actually practices what we've been preaching in terms of spanning the sectors and, and in, in office in her different roles. She's actually done that. Margaret, there are a couple of people, John Richter and some others on the chat have been suggesting the private uh, public partnerships and, and, you know, Margaret's too modest to actually talk about things that she worked with just with the Stanford government, uh, with, with the mayors and others in terms of transportation infrastructure and things and getting folks from the trains all around uh, to her workplaces and things. And it's an enormous company that she has. If you don't know what Synchrony is, it, it is sort of the, the back room of so many of these private label credit cards of thousands and thousands of employees. And it's a, it's a great boon to us, but it's that's all warm up to talking about Jim. But what I really wanted to say is that uh, he referred to those two reports and maybe Jim or, or maybe maybe Stephen, if you have it, we could so in my office, we could just put into the chat uh, the link to those two the two reports. The first one came out, I think, in March of 2018. It was about 125 pages, single space, too. And it was um, it wasn't a hand wringing study of problems alone. It had some very concrete solutions. But then they held themselves to a report card for that follow up, he said, which is about a 25, 30 page follow up, as I recall, which was in November, I think, of, of the in the fall. And, and, and that's what became a guideline for both what advanced CT uses a lot as, as guidance. And I think the Department of uh, Economic Development uh, and Com Community Economic Development has relied upon with Glendale and David, uh, David Lehman and others as a pathway. And that's, it's, it's a model of, in the past, John, as you remember, uh, and, and, and Jim would remember, and we're probably the only ones on this call that maybe can remember, there was a time way back on economic development where the Hartford uh, group, the Hartford was the model of collaboration uh, between sectors. Uh, it wasn't necessarily statewide, and that's what 
Jim's group represents, and we think advanced CT and things like that and Connecticut innovations, but it, it didn't used to be statewide, it was city by city. That's another big change in the last few years. But I, I started working in, 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 in economic development, municipal economic development, believe it or not, in 1970, 75, yes, I'm that old, in Philadelphia. And we, in the Philadelphia Partnership, we're merging with something called the Philadelphia Movement, the Greater Philadelphia Movement. There are a lot of politics about it. And basically, as only Jim would know, all the banks that I worked with then are all gone. Then we thought they were the, they're the backbones of Philadelphia. But we kept looking to Minneapolis and San Francisco, Pittsburgh and Hartford as the models for how things should work. In Hartford, it really fell apart. It's a shame. And what's come together now is, is the spirit of collaboration. And I just wanted to make that comment that it's something that's really changed. And thank you, Jim, for getting that going statewide now. Thank you, Jeff. Um, hey, look, I, I'll, I'll I jump have... on that, John, if, if you'll allow me. Please go ahead. Just because yes, please. since Jeff highlighted some of the work in the report, you know, the, the what I've described as the specific recommendations about the university and then the scholarships were two of the uh, recommendations, but that report understood and publicized, I think, more than had been for a long time, that it was a workforce uh, problem, meeting the needs of the community, and how do you organize around that to make sure you do a better job? And I think we've made a lot of progress on that in the interim, but as we've said, we still have a ways to go. But we're talking about what's the quantity and the quality of the STEM talent that we have in the state, and how do we improve that? How do we transform the national profile of our universities working in concert with business and government and getting advantage of investment of research public funds into those universities to help them leverage up what they're able to do. We identified InsureTech where we could be a globally recognized player, that we could be a national leader in innovative care delivery, that we could deliver on Connecticut's potential as a biotech R&D hub. This was five years ago, right? And, and you may say it was obvious, but we narrowed it down yeah. about a thousand things to you know, a much fewer things overall developing an entrepreneurial bent throughout the education systems in Connecticut, building a responsive dynamic curricula in our state universities, uh, in our community colleges in particular. So many opportunities to improve the way that we educate people on the one hand, and then to match the needs of the workforce with the ability to turn out those uh, well-versed players now who would meet those needs supported by government as well. That's the ticket and we have to organize around that. I, I just want to remind folks that if you have a question for our panelists, you can uh, hit up the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we do have a lot coming in because this uh, conversation is flying by already. I want, want to get to a few. And we have a, a question here posted by the Greater Hartford African American Alliance. Would it be possible for panelists to share their responses with respect to the perspectives of Connecticut's urban centers and those members of the workforce that live within these municipalities and the status of black and brown businesses and entrepreneurs? There are drastic inequities, they write, within the state of Connecticut for black and brown residents and businesses, access to these technologies are still not equitable across the state, both academically in our schools and in our neighborhoods. Who would like to jump in and answer this question from, uh, from the GHAAA? Well, I'll jump in. I think um, like anything, we have a, a commitment that each business really has to look at this and look in the mirror and say, how are we helping our communities and particularly businesses within our communities. You know, I can tell you that for Synchrony, we've been doing a lot of things, including working with our high schools right now to create programs where we're teaching them technology. We have had something about about 100 students come through our lab in Stafford where they're getting certified on certain technologies. What I would tell you, it's been a fascinating program and even more fascinating to see how these students who maybe would not have thought of a tech career. Um, we graduated a, a group this past summer. All, all of the seniors, there were eight, are all going into tech now based on their experience. Um, look, it's a drop in the bucket and I think we have a lot of work to do to really kind of tap into those um, communities to really make sure we're giving back. We most recently included a program where we're working with adults who have uh, the, the uh, desire to really learn technology and we're, we're holding classes online. Um, we're learning a little bit about this one, but I think both the governor, the community, we're all realizing that there's a wealth of untapped uh, folks in our communities that really could be uh, 
big in our workforce if we can really figure out how to advance their skills. And this is really gets back to your skill question earlier. We have to match the skills with the needs. Um, and I think, you know, again, you need private sector, public sector, the universities, the community colleges, the high schools to really start uh, those programs. And we all have to work together. We, we have a way to go on this this topic, I think. If I may, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. If I may jump in, because um, I really appreciate the question, and you know, I think all of you know the the topics that we discussed today and how we really advance our economy forward, we have to really ensure that we are intentional and centered on inclusive growth. And equity has to be at the center of that. And we all know most of our black and brown communities are in our urban centers. And so how do we rise all uh everyone together, essentially. And so, you know, with that, from Amazon's point of view, I think it's important that we leverage our platform um, to help uh, minority businesses and small businesses in our state. And that's why, um, as part of, you know, my efforts in April of this year, we actually had our first supplier diversity event in Connecticut hosted at the Connecticut Convention Center, where we had hundreds of, you know, small businesses um, and uh, minority owned businesses that came and were able to uh, connect and network and really understand how do they become a supplier of Amazon? Because I know oftentimes people think, oh, Amazon is this big company. They have kind of a locked in network um, that there's no opportunity for me. And so this was really an intentional effort to do that outreach um, and educate people on, no, there is a plethora of opportunities. We have an entire network of suppliers that we need to ensure that our businesses and our operations run efficiently in the state. And so this was really uh, an opportunity for us to advance that and, and collaborate in that way with many of our partners and the, the Department of Economic and Community Development um, being one of them. Um, additionally, I would say that, you know, to Margaret's point about uh, really talent and broadening the, the skill set and skill base of our talent is really important. And, you know, we have over 28 sites, meaning Amazon and the state of Connecticut, uh, where we are employing thousands of individuals. We're upwards of 16,000 in the state uh, to date. Um, and a part of our kind of upskilling efforts is we announced that by 2025, we were going to upskill 300,000 workers across the nation, of which many of those are in Connecticut. Um, and a part of this, we have a career choice program, which is one of our signature programs that is enabling this upskilling uh, effort. And so this year, we expanded our partner institutions to include the University of Connecticut, which is all of its campuses across the state, as well as Capital Community College in Hartford. Um, where our hourly employees that work at our facilities have the ability to get prepaid tuition um, at those schools for short-term certifications, your two-year degree, your four-year degree, um, and in-demand industries. Um, and so really our contribution to you can grow with Amazon as part of that upskilling effort, or you can move on and, and go to another company um, to pursue your passion um, of in-demand skills that are needed in our economy today. John, could I, I just wanted to say uh, please about Glenn that I had the privilege of working with her. I think all of us did when she was at DECD. She did an absolutely fabulous job and she was a clear, consistent, passionate and objective voice for equity throughout the time that she was there. And it helped us to focus on some important choices that needed to be made. And you can see you can see that she's continuing that at Amazon as well. So kudos to you, Glenn, and thank you also. And I, I know that that's how David Lehman, who's the DECD commissioner, feels about it as well. And I know that goes right up to Governor Lamont. And all the discussions we've had inside Advanced CT has to do with how do we address the issues of equity, which will take a generation or more to resolve but we need to be focused on that as a primary objective of any of the economic policies that we're advancing. And I, I think it's important to recognize that there still are some structural disadvantages, whether it's you know, how property taxes get applied. And I'm happy to see that Governor Lamont and the legislature are trying to address that on car taxes, for example. Uh, what about access to housing? And is that 
uh, the way that it ought to be. Is that really fair? And there's questions out there about fairness or not. And then what do we have the opportunity and the responsibility to do about that? What are the healthcare services available to black and brown people in urban areas as opposed to other people? How do they get to and from their schools or their jobs that they may have? Uh, what kind of opportunity are they afforded? And it is central to the economic action plan that was passed in the last legislature. And so I think I can say that um, the governor and others are, are effectively putting their money where their mouths are, let's say, and trying to do their best to overcome some of these issues mm -hmm. to create opportunity uh, and equitably so for all. If I could uh, join on, on that uh, round too, although I, I think that that Margaret, Glenn, and Jim have uh, very powerfully responded from the perspectives of the, the state and, and collaboration with industry, uh, picking up on some points, you know, again, not to uh, to echo John Richter's question in the, in, the, uh, in the chat, but he's pushed for that. But the very first questioner who gets extra credit, that's the first question, was uh, Carol Power had asked the question of going uh, even beyond um, uh, with some of the forces we're talking about to take a look at the uh, at the high school level and vocational technical education. I think Carol Carol's question not just only extra credit is the first question, but also because it, it ties in right here as we take a look at the full portfolio of this challenge uh, of inclusive growth. Because we can brag about top line issues, but as as Fred points out in the chat and others, uh, we have to take a look at disparities. And um, as we look at that, uh, even higher education. Uh, since I'll do this from a non-Yale perspective, uh, the, the state schools, of course, uh, the state universities, colleges have been terrific. Uh, Joe Bertolino has uh, many kinds of technical outreach programs at, at you know, University of, uh, of Southern uh, Connecticut. But I'm uh, thinking uh, Joanne Berger Sweeney has a lot of technical outreach with Infosys and others, uh, of course, at, at Trinity, uh, uh, Judy Olian, President Olian at uh, Quinnipiac has uh, really been focusing hard on one of our areas of greatest shortages. You may have heard the governor and others talk about the critical shortage of nurses, that they've been working very hard in investing in a collaborative way uh, with uh, with hospitals. I think they're working with Hartford Health. Uh, we wish it was Yale New Haven, but they're doing very well with Hartford Health and a, and a great uh, collaboration with Quinnipiac and uh, uh, Michael Roth with a lot of community engagement uh, and programs are working on at, at Wesleyan and 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 uh, Carolyn Bergeron at Connecticut College and others. So even the private colleges have been doing a lot, but we still on that that question about the high schools. I think we can do mm -hmm. more there. I think they're offhand. I could be wrong because there's so many knowledgeable people on this call. I think there are 17 or 18, but I think it's 17 truly focused technical high schools in the state. Uh, we could we could use more. Now those high schools, I think. Are, are a national um, beacon of success with a 91% a graduation rate, which is very high for any high school, not to mention vocational and technical schools. And But the added feature that ours have in Connecticut is those 17 schools with that high graduation rate, uh, and it's drawing mm -hmm. heavily on Urban Core, by the way, are with industry partnerships. We have 600 industry partnerships at the vocational technical high school level. Uh, and, and again, we don't wanna say uh, we're done, uh, but that's a good momentum to draw on. And we have a, a, a thousand students coming out of there are, are enrolled in, in classes for college credit in those high schools, which is a statement of how good uh, the quality of the education is or the students is, or even maybe some of the teachers, you know, so yeah. uh, and the administration. So anyhow, I, I, I think that this is an important area. But we have some some very some very successful elements to to showcase more and build the momentum around them. We're we're getting a lot of really good questions, um, much better questions than I would have prepared uh, from Gary George here. Um, uh, Gary asks, what financial considerations attract tech companies to a municipality? What makes a good location, real estate, culture, arts, education resources for a tech company to move into? How influential are property tax breaks in tech companies deciding where to locate? Glenn, I'm wondering if you might, might dive into that a little bit. I, I'd love a little bit more depth on that uh, topic because we've already touched on the, that a little bit, but I think Gary asks a very good question. So uh, I'll jump in there. I think, you know, access to skilled talent as we keep beating that drum and that is a common thread that you're gonna continue to hear throughout the conversation and through uh, my fellow panelists um, is really important. Um, you know, location, location matters for that particular business and what that ecosystem looks like 
depending on where that business is operations is about, right? What are they trying to accomplish? Is there a natural ecosystem that they can align with where they're going to be able to access um, supply chain or skilled talent, if you will? Um, and I think quality of life and, and being able to have communities where uh, they can retain talent and attract, and attract talent. But I think there's been a, a paradigm shift to some degree on, you know, it used to be the case where people went to where the jobs are and now employers and jobs are going to where the people are. And so quality of place is really important and talent is putting a premium on that. And I think that's an opportunity where the state can triple down and double down on ensuring that we have, you know, modernization of housing, transit oriented development where you have, you know, multiple mobility options, um, infrastructure, uh, and things of that nature that really kind of convenience, make a, a place uh, where people want to live, work, and play. Um, and then a welcoming environment, like how welcoming is the state to that particular industry and to the tech you know, industry, I think really matters where they can have a strong partnership that is mutually beneficial, ultimately really matters as well. But, but one thing that I think Bill Gunther puts in his piece, Margaret, which is important to note here is, you know, for so many years on the radio, I had conversations about this. You know, how, how do we make Connecticut a place where people want to live and work and play? And the, the place building that Glenn just talked about. But so much has changed in just the last couple of years about how workers in some industries can work. There is the possibility of Connecticut firms employing people in other places that aren't Connecticut. There's the possibility of firms from outside of Connecticut employing people who very happily live and work and go to the beach here in the state. I mean, how much did COVID change all of the things that Glenn just talked about being so important about making a place where business can thrive? I think COVID's changed everything. And I, I, I often say we're kind of still in a big experiment in terms of workers and what workers are really seeking and where they really want to live and work. Um, I think we have opportunities um, as you said, to get people who are living in Connecticut to stay in Connecticut, but work in companies outside of Connecticut, if, if that's what they choose. But I think the bigger opportunity, in my opinion, as people are allowed to work from home, that is a great source for us in terms of people living in Connecticut and not having to commute. I think the ability to not have to get on a train and go into New York City is a huge advantage. I think, you know, going into the office three days a week and not having to drive your car you know, on 95 of the Merritt Parkway are huge opportunities or 84. So I, I think, I still think while, while it's changed how workers see things, I still think Connecticut is a place where people want to come and live. And we saw that as, you know, droves of people moved out of New York City and other cities and came into the local communities here in, in Connecticut. I mean, all you have to do is walk down main streets now and you see a lot more young families than we saw, you know, I don't know, five years ago. Um, and I think the important part for us now is really how do we continue to leverage and tap into that and continue to work on the things that we know are really important to the communities um, to keep the people here. Um, and I, I do think, again, I feel we have a great foundation from which to build off, but we can't, we can't get um, lazy and not really continue to focus on businesses and bringing businesses into the state um, to really create those jobs. And, and Jim, you know, you've worked on this for such a long time and we've talked about transportation issues in the state. It's not that we don't still need to make sure people can get to work in a timely manner. We do. We absolutely do. But I think Margaret just laid out a future in which the reliance of getting on a train to go to New York, the reliance of getting in a car and going into Hartford, it's just not the same as what it was. And are, are, are we reacting quickly enough to this change in the way that people are working? Well, Margaret's exactly right that the uh, importance of location where people decide where they want to live is much greater even than it was before. And because it's no longer live and work, it could be live or work. And when people started looking around, they said of the choices I could make, I want to be in Connecticut. And that's why we've had so many positive address changes, more than we've seen in decades, right, in the last year or so, because people are voting to be here because they like the high quality of life. So that's an important component that allows us to attract people. Uh, but we have other responsibilities as well. We have to invest in the transportation system. Now, I was on a Metro North train a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. I couldn't believe the difference from four or five years ago. 
and the politeness uh, and the on time and the overall speed of the train. I mean, improvements have been made. Sometimes this is slow on the common. It's hard for people to appreciate it and change their perception of things, but there is progress being made. The special transportation fund is back in a more solvent position. We're going to be able to invest in our transportation needs in the future. Uh, a lot of it will be rail, some of it will be highway as well, some of it will be air. You know, look at the Tweed Airport, look at Breeze Airways, look at all the things that are happening in Connecticut. So we're gaining ground on these things because the investments are being made. It's not just happening by itself. So I think that uh, transportation uh, is one of them, you know, that goes with education. And by the way, the point was made, I think, in the chat room that this isn't just about young people that are 18 to 22. This is about workforce. This is about reskill. You want to have greater opportunity. We're going to be able to reskill our workforce. It doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 30 or 40 or 50 or even older than that. You can be part of this you know, ongoing change. So all those things are taking place at various degrees and it's part of the reason that I think we're making a good progress that we are. And it holds a lot of promise for the future. I, I hate to break into a, a, what I'm sure is a scintillating chat conversation between Jeff Sonnenfeld and Fred Carstensen uh, in the chat, <laughs> but maybe we can make some of this public for the rest of the folks who are just watching this here. Fred Carstensen uh, writes a question. He says, um, and of course, Fred, the longtime uh, economic guru from the University of Connecticut. Uh, I've talked to Fred a number of times about this. And when I didn't call him to talk about it, he would leave a message asking why. It's just a little joke, Fred. Um, uh, Jeff has pointed, he writes, to a variety of very persuasive statistics about how well Connecticut is doing, he writes, but uh, Connecticut is often invisible because it's split between different statistical geographies. As a whole, Connecticut's smaller than a dozen MSAs. And if evaluated as an MSA, Connecticut would rank very high in biomedical, advanced manufacturing, and other sectors. How can Connecticut make itself visible to the American business community? What should the state be doing to improve its data framework? That's another good question. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to chime in on that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Fred in the chat, you see, it raised a really good point just about the, the data collection. I remember in the distant past, not to name names, but uh, we just, uh, for whatever reasons, it was a turf or sense of values or whatever it was, but even the Connecticut Department of Labor wouldn't talk to their neighbors, the D Department of Economic and Community Development. That's no longer the case at all. We had employers that often were uh, quite focused on other states or, or servicing uh, clients outside the state and didn't collaborate as employers. We see there's a very strong uh, multi-generational and family and small and mid-sized business ecostructure here. E and that ecosphere very much supports the larger businesses. But was there collaboration between all those forces? There wasn't. There is now. Now state agencies not only are willing to talk to each other, they'll actually talk to other people too. And, and that the employers talk to each other. So when we see that there are opportunities for some sort of high pressure skilled welder at electric boat and they have you know perhaps an excess number of them uh, right now at Sikorsky or Sikorsky will talk to uh, Stanley Black and Decker that we're finding that that there are ways or there's collaboration just in terms of training initiatives or people we, we talked about early career which is very very important in launching people but we also have challenges with a mature workforce and and uh, all these, uh, well, we're looking for the Guinevere's and, and Arthur's rising up, you know, in our Camelot here. We also have all these Merlins and others too that I think have great value as as mentors and as 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 really skilled uh, tradespeople, making sure that we find opportunities for them and better data tracking is what Fred calls for, and I agree with them too that we need to talk more and share that data more. But uh, but thanks, John, for raising that point. And, and Jeff, I would just add through advanced CT. You know, one of the things that I observed when I first started getting involved is the state was kind of like the lower state and then Hartford and you had New Haven in the middle. There wasn't a lot of dialogue across the state, across the corridor. And I think now companies and CEOs and businesses um, have connected through advanced CT and we all have the same goals in mind. We want to create an environment for our employees that is great. We want to bring more people into the state. And I think our networking amongst the CEOs across the state is really um, at a much higher level than it was, you know, three, four, five years ago. And I think you're getting more and more CEOs engaged. And we see the value of, you know, the corridor and how we can build different industries within the state. So I think that's been, a, in my opinion, and I've been here a while in the state, a big, big shift in terms of how we're all trying to, you know, row the boat in the same direction and leverage the opportunities we see in the state, but really working with each other and sharing ideas and really, you know, thinking out of the box. I, I just want to add one thing too and say, first Fred, uh, 
you have contributed so much uh, and you're, you're a data maniac and you know more <laughs> about data than almost anybody and how to apply it. And so when you speak about what may be lacking, you know, we listen closely. I actually had the pleasure of uh, helping sponsor your uh, CEAC program for the economic analysis you put out. So I got very familiar with some of your issues and you know, you're a real asset to the state. I, I think your, your point in particular about the data and the form of the data, we're disadvantaged because we have these standard metropolitan statistical areas that compare with others and ours are 300,000 and theirs are a million or a million too. So when you're looking for impact, you don't see it in that kind of a comparison all the time. But if we could put some of our SMAs together, look, we only have 3.5 million people living in the state. The workforce is under a million seven. That compares to Cleveland or you know whoever it is. We've got to do a better job of getting it out there and showing the critical mass of the the uh, capabilities that we have. So I think that's another really good point that you've made. I don't know that the, the rating world will accept that, that we're combining our SMSAs, but we certainly ought to try, uh, and whether through them or you know directly to the people that we're trying to talk to, we need to get that out there and have people understand the totality of our strength. Well, and Jim, that even goes as putting uh, back uh, on, the, on the front burner, uh, what Glenn does for a living these days is I, I saw the pitches and maybe others on this call saw, and I know you did too, and, and Margaret did, the, the very separatist pitches for M, the, the Amazon second headquarters. And I know that to some that was a controversial uh, move, but even if this was a shared priority for the state, you, you wouldn't have known it because every part of the state had a, a separate pitch. So in the spirit of that last question, the way you phrased it, John, I think that's exactly right. Had we harnessed our collaborative efforts and of course, had Glenn been there at the time too, uh, not to mention Ingenui on the board as of course uh, your, your fellow co-chair, uh, we would have had probably a, a, a different outcome, but, um, but yeah, is that we do, we have had a balkanized past in the state and I think we've, we've triumphed that in the process anyway. Uh and I, if I may just, yeah, if I may just jump in there, because I think, you know, Margaret made a great point on just the CEOs really making intentional efforts to think more holist holistically and kind of bringing the Fairfield County, New Haven County, Connecticut County, and really looking at one state. But I think, too, the governor really kind of took that uh, a step forward and the Department of Economic and Community Development really looking at cross-border collaboration and Connecticut as part of this greater region to really expand our capacity and leverage our strengths there. Um, because I know there was one uh, data point where Connecticut is within 500 miles of 30% of the nation's GDP and jobs. And so just think about that from a strategic location perspective on how we can really leverage our New York partners, our Massachusetts partners, our Rhode Island partners to really have a critical mass of people, idea and talents to grow collectively together. Mm. I, I want to get to a question from Mark here, which is really interesting. Mark Mathias says, uh, most discussions I hear in Connecticut focus on emphasizing existing industries such as biotech, manufacturing, financial services and more. What can be done to pursue new growth industries such as artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles and more? These could not only attract new talent, but new industries that will bring new revenues to the state. Who wants to jump in on that? I'll just make a quick comment. I talked earlier about it's about capital and how you allocate the capital and the choices that you make and recognizing you have limited capital and are you deploying it to the maximum effect? And while we always ought to have an eye for the new innovative and entrepreneurial and be able to invest in it, that should not take precedence over investing in our logistically strong industries that have long supply chains that are, that are growing faster than the market because that's where the economic growth is gonna come for. So, uh, we just have to be sensitive about limited capital. How do we invest that capital? Not to exclude good ideas, but not to go after them instead of getting stronger at the core. Build on what you have, leverage that, build from within. Uh, and so I think that's one of those hard choices that has to be made. It goes back to the four C's. We've got to spend a lot of time on those four C's uh, for choice and capital and commitment and collaboration and decide what does that mean in making these choices, particularly regarding technology and workforce. And does anybody on have those, a dissent? Well, well I just, just quickly though, Je Jeff, if you don't mind, cause we're running low on time. Does anybody have a dissenting opinion on that though? I mean, there is a, there is a, a point to be made that perhaps, you know, Connecticut has built itself on certain industries 
over the course of time. And yes, doubling down on investing in those industries in the best way possible makes a lot of sense. Is there a case to be made that bringing in new technologies into the state actually might point to a future uh, uh, in the state that's a little different than the one we've had in the past? Uh, given that we don't hear a dissenter, it stopped me as soon as you hear a dissent. Uh, I don't hear it on the, on, least on the, on the panel. I guess, is, I guess we don't have a dissent. It, as I, I would point out, though, there were complaints uh, back five years ago uh, that they would struggle to find uh, not just qualified talent, but venture capital. And what we have seen, we have seen uh, tremendous growth in every part of the venture uh, world, whether or not it is uh, angel funds, whether or not it's early stage, mid stage or later stage. We've seen growth in each each one of them, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but they, 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 we didn't have historically deep pools. Right now, we have about 300 billion in assets under management, which is it was quite a quite a growth for uh, asset management in the state and including the, the improving the business uh, climate. Advanced manufacturing, fintech uh, contribute, and biosciences about 100 billion alone into the state's gross domestic product. You know, gross product. So it's a huge contributor, and and well over 200,000 jobs have been created just the last few years in those targeted industries that he was talking about. And Connecticut now ranks fifth, fifth among all 50 states in patenting activity, doubling the number of patents in the last decade. So we could, we could, if we had the time, and I know we don't, we could start to spin through the names of many of these exciting uh, startups and early stage businesses. Uh, Bill Sheehan writes, uh, folks in Eastern Connecticut believe that the movers and shakers uh, believe that Connecticut ends at the Connecticut River and ignores the efforts in Southeastern Connecticut. We've talked, as we always do, about Fairfield County. We've talked about the greater Hartford region. Uh, folks in, in uh, Southeast Connecticut, is there a connection being made there and what needs to be done to make sure that that part of the state does not feel uh, left out? Well, there is a connection there. Look at electric boat. And look at the tens of thousands of jobs that they could bring to the region, which is supported every day and actively so by uh, the governor himself, by DECD really intensively, and by other agencies as well. Uh, I also know that in the economic action plan, that provision was made not just to fund the core centers in Stanford and New Haven and Hartford, but to expand that to other communities as well. And in particular, making sure that uh, East of the river, as I think he called it, right, gets its share of that funding as well. Any municipality that comes forward with a good idea is going to get that funded on a priority basis as compared to the other ideas. That's the best and most efficient use of the capital that we have. And certainly Eastern Connecticut is within that group. And in my mind, it'll be a powerhouse for us five to 10 years from now because of the continuing expansion that's provided through uh, electric boat in particular, and other uh, high technology activities. We have just a couple minutes left, and we've had a lot of optimistic talk, obviously, amongst this group, which is, I think, a very good thing. Um, I, I'm wondering, Margaret, are there any challenges that you think the state needs to overcome to address some of the issues that we've raised here in terms of making uh, the state a place where people can invest in technology and align the workforce with the jobs that are out there? I mean, what are our, what are our big challenges right now? So, you know, I, I think one of the challenges, we talked a little bit about this, is just how we're communicating about this. I think the state in general has just had so much negativity about it in the press and around that I think we need to do a better job taking the facts and the data that you know Jeff and some of the team have talked about here and really figure out a way to really get that message outside of the state so that we can attract more businesses in. Um, I still think our story is not being told. And I, I think the plethora of really good things we have here aren't always understood either. So I, I still think we have that opportunity. Look, I don't think we're gonna fix some of the fundamental things people have talked about, you know, the tax rate, things like that. Um, but there, there, there are more positives than negatives. And I think um, the ability to really get our story told in the right way with facts and information, I think we have more work to do there. Uh, Glenn, how about you? I mean, a, a challenge to overcome. Do you, do you think that the, the communication piece of it is, is, a big, is a big part or what else do you think we need to overcome here to, to get where we need to be? I mean, I, I'm definitely aligned with Margaret on communication. Again, like we can be our best ambassadors or our worst <laughs> ambassadors, right? And so, again, how do we really lean into our strengths and elevate that message and, and really tell that story wide, deep, and broad? 
Um, so definitely a challenge that I think, you know, a lot of good progress has been made. I know um, the Department of Economic and Community Development through their marketing and communications fund has made significant investments to really elevate that. Um, but in addition to, to that, I would add, you know, I would just go back to my original comments around uh, equity and disparities, right? And I think if we are not intentionally focused on that, that is going to continue to be a Achilles heel for our economy. And we are not going to get maximum productivity out of our residents. So we have to be mm. able to really go deep um, and, and really raise income levels up. Um, to remove those disparities for the long term. We just have about a minute left for each of you to give some closing thoughts. Jim, I'll, I'll let you go. A closing thought from you. Thank you, John. I, I'll just say, I'll just follow on to that and say that I think that overcoming uh, the perception that we are fiscally imprudent goes a really long way to cementing business confidence over the long term. And the fact we've been able to pay down our Pension liabilities, the rate we have, we've been able to hold tax rates, we've made it a fiscally more responsible state, and having the bond cap in place so that we have uh, covenants that don't allow our legislature to override them so that we're assured of having several more years of that fiscal prudence, I think, is a huge factor here. And it takes a while for this to sink in on people. The other thing is we have to deliver on our workforce promises so that the employers aren't leaving because they have to get their workforce elsewhere, that will turn a negative into a positive. And we have to make uh, our companies more successful. And as we do more of that, they will become more positive. They will stay here. They will grow here. And then other companies will want to locate here. That's the promise of the years ahead. And, and Jeff, I'll give you the last word here, just a little bit less than a minute left, because we want to give people the time to you know get some lunch and get back to work. But go ahead, Jeff. Oh, you're muted, sir. If, if, I would, if I would add to anything that, that Margaret had on her list of things that we should work on, it's, it's uh, being more proud and don't think that we have to be so uh, constantly uh, tearing at each other in a self-critical way to build on those strengths. Thinking of aviation, I bet very few people realize where is Connecticut number one? We are the number one uh, uh, most uh, concentrated state for aerospace manufacturing in the, in the country. Number one, we have 135 thousand jobs there, number one in airplane, airplane parts manufacturing, uh, and number two in shipbuilding. Who who would know that? And that's, this is, you know, an awful lot of, of jobs. There are a lot to be proud of, thousands of them, thousands of them. And uh, so I think there's, uh, there are big contributors to the state uh, in terms of the average wealth of the families uh, working there, but also in terms of the, the health and well-being of the state and the, and the skill sets that we're, we're building. Uh, the, the CEO of, of, of Sikorsky said that he's worked in, in Maryland, Texas, Florida, in uh, Paul Lemo, and he said, there's been no state in the country where we have such great collaboration between the, mm -hmm. the governor's office, between public sector in general, between private industry and the ecostructure of industrials here that we just love Connecticut as our favorite state. Wow, uh, collaboration in Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut's our favorite state. Boy, somehow or other, we, we don't ever hear this whenever people talk about Connecticut elsewhere. Uh, right. Maybe we should uh, send a video of this to, to some folks. I wanna thank our guests, Jeff Sonnenfeld, Glenn Thames, Margaret Keene, and Jim Smith. Thank you all so much for being here and for being part of this conversation. Thanks to all the people who had the excellent questions in Q&A, got to as many of them as we possibly could, and all of the wonderful back and forth in the chat as well. That's always a big, lively part of these conversations. I want to thank our friend Bill Gunther, who's a founding officer of Connecticut Compact, this nonprofit initiative committed to building consensus on the most pressing challenges and opportunities in the state, focused on economic strategy. He's really the thought leader that helped to bring this together, and we present this in uh, collaboration with Connecticut Compact. I also wanna say that you can read his most recent piece in the Connecticut Viewpoint section. You can read an awful lot of economic development reporting from Erica Phillips, our economic development reporter at ctmirror.org. I wanna thank Kyle Constable and Gabby DeBenedictus for running this event and to Bruce Putterman for being uh, so instrumental in bringing conversations like this together at the Connecticut Mirror. Thanks again, everyone for joining us. I'm John Dankosky. It's great to see you, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you all.